Um, and hello to our online audience. Welcome to this session hosted by the Lawyers Hub on the complex world of consent, balancing convenience and privacy in a digital era. Today, or this evening, we are going to be canvassing an interesting conversation um, on consent, and I really look forward to your participation and the panel discussion. I see a few more people are coming in, which is great. Um, more people to contribute to the conversation. And um, yeah, feel free for our on online audience, if you are not already following us on YouTube, feel free to um, subscribe, and we encourage you to follow uh, keep following um, the updates and or videos that we post um, because we share a lot of content around uh, regulatory and our policy conversations uh, in Kenya and across the continent. I am Susan Otieno. I will be your moderator for this uh, session. And we are going to, um, the format for the session will be um, a bit uh, varied. We'll have a presentation and then after the presentation we'll get into the panel discussion and after the panel discussion we'll have a Q&A and you can ask um, any questions that you have in mind and the panel will be able to canvas those questions and then after that we will have a little picture taking. So I have a question for you guys. Um, have you ever gone to a club and they used your image on their social media? anyone or you don't go clubbing that's also an option like it's fine like <laughs> i also i'm not a clubber so i'm seeing no hands no oh okay okay two two people okay cool three people <laughs> interesting interesting i don't know if you saw this post it was on twitter um about this i think it's a uh, an image of people seated, I think, in a club and then around a table, and they put smiley faces on their face. <laughs> so it's interesting to see how uh, different organizations and clubs are managing this idea of uh, consent and also how they're um, updating their social media um, policies and doing marketing for their um, establishments. So uh, we are now going to get into the presentation and our Dixon Ogugu is going to take us through this. So I will invite Dixon to come in and um, take us through. Okay, uh, thank you, Susan. Susan, uh, I'm Dixon Shem. I work at the Lawyers Hub. And uh, I'll just be taking you through a small presentation. But then before then, uh, maybe you can do a, a quick sigh. This is not my phone. So this is not my phone. So any volunteer? Any volunteer? For, for something small. <laughs> yeah? Let's just uh, use our own. So I want her to take a picture of this part. Yeah. Let's imagine this, this is the person. Yeah, she takes the picture. Remember, this is not her phone, <laughs> but she has taken a picture. So I have a question. Who holds the copyright to that particular photo? Anyone? Yeah? Ah. Who? The person on the photo. Any alternative? Who has the right over this person, over the photo? But uh, she's just taking a photo here. So who has the right? The person. Yeah, she has said the, her, the person. Who else has an alternative answer? Yeah, Let, let's answer the question in our slides. <laughs> yeah, be very attentive and look out on how, who holds the, I don't want the panelists to answer because I know they have the answer. <laughs> yeah, so uh, let's just start in our first uh, presentation. So what's consent? Consent is, uh, according to the act, is a clear and eh, voluntary expression that is given either by a signature or by affirmation. 
and it must be uh, exp expressed and uh, indicating an agreement to a particular process processing of a particular data by an identifiable person that is a person that is identifiable natural person is a person who can be identified by a, by an identifier such as a name uh, physicality uh, location number and online identifier like uh, such as the digital ids also you have the processing what's processing is the action or the series of actions performed on your data that's pursuant to the data protection act personal data breach is a breach of security leading to accidental or unlawful uh, destruction or access to a particular data in a particular database so going moving to the next slide you can see the principles that actually underline data protection act and the one principle the data subject sides to privacy that is you as a subject has your rights to privacy and the, the second one is the lawful fair and transparent uh, in relation to processing of your data another one is the data collection which must be specific explicit legitimate purposes the, the another one is a valid explanation as to why and why and what and what are you going to do, are you going to do it with that particular data another one is data accuracy and also we have uh, last data retained in an infallible form these are among other principles that underline data protection uh, in kenya pursuant to the act of 2019. so and to the next one is the data subject sites which are the use or the use of your data who has access to your data you have the rights to object to processing of your data correction so if there's a, an inaccuracy in your data like for example someone like writes my name as jackson not dixon so have the rights to co collect that particular info in, in uh, wrong also have a right to deletion so i can go to my school in kenya school of law and tell them to remove my name from the other so i have the rights to deletion uh on to the next slide you can see uh, before collection of your data the processor and the controller must tell you your right according to section 26 the purpose of which they are collecting your data access who has access to your data security measures in place and lastly consequences if you don't provide that particular information they require uh, into the next slide you can see the lawful processing of your data personal data cannot be processed unless data subjects consent at some point consent cannot be uh, obtained in necessary conditions such as contractual obligations uh, legal compliance of the data, uh, data control and, and processor public interest uh, public tasks legitimate interest and also historical strategic and journalist, journalistic or artistic research so these are instances where you do not need your consent uh, person to the act yeah so going to the next slide you can see conditions of consent you have to prove that the data subject has consented the processor has to prove that you have consented you have the right to withdraw your consent as a person as a the subject you have the right to process i have just mentioned and then and then you have the right to commercial use so in the according to the act uh the subject has uh, the rights to that particular commercial use you have to give you express consent when your picture or image is going to be used for commercial use Ex express consent and then uh, at some point it's authorized by the law so let's go to image rights where it's a very controversial issue in the last two weeks so image rights you have to express your permission to use a person's photo so what's an image right your likeness you are the way you look so it cannot be used for filming uh, recording advertising without your consent so image rights are becoming more vulnerable due to the technological advancements and changes in the market also internet has become uh, uh internet has made it easy for one to access your your photo maybe in linkedin google uh these sites do not actually these rights vary from different jurisdictions like the us they call it rights to publicity it's linked to the right to privacy in their, in their various laws 
in French, uh, the, the right is in French is in the protection under the Article 9, Article 9 of the French Civil Code and Article 8 of the European Convention of Human Rights. That's where you find the rights to image rights. Uh, you need permission to access, uh, to use the image rights in French, in the French countries. So moving on to Kenya, uh, to our next slide, this is where now we have a controversy. There have been cases actually uh, in Kenya touching on these particular issues. So number one, uh, the UN, the UN Kamenu, Kamena versus KTD Agency Limited. You can just give a brief history about this particular case. Uh, UN was, uh, was the KTD used UN's photo in the brochure to advertise for a particular, a particular advertisement. So UN took them to court, telling that you cannot use my photo without my consent. So the argument for KTD was, that she, she posed for the photo and it was taken. So for example, I go there, I pose, and then you take my photo. Then they have the right to use it. That's the argument of KTDA in the court. But then the court said, and did not give you express consent for you to use their photo for commercial purposes. A very con also a very detailed case of uh, Jessica uh, and the construction, the construction center. In this particular case, uh, the construction center used the Jessica's photo in the billboards and also in their websites. Jessica took them to court, saying uh, she did not consent to them using that particular photo in their particular billboards. The same applies to the recent case of uh, the, the school, where they used the child's photo in the, in the billboards. So the court said she did not consent to, to that particular uh, picture being given to to them. This, at this particular time, we do not have the Data Protection Act in place. Recently, uh, the Catherine one uh, actually had the Data Protection Act in place, and uh, the courts explicitly said that you do not consent. You have to consent for your effort to be used for commercial purposes. Same as at the University of Kabianga is a very famous case, you know, about that particular student who was used in the graduation uh, photo, also the Marseille University. So there are three elements in this particular case for Jessica, which I've, I've just mentioned uh, must be attributed for you to prove that your, your right has not been infringed. Number one is use of protected attributes, such as your image is a protected attribute. Number two, you have to show that it's like exploitative purpose. That is, it's used for commercial purposes. The number three one, the last one, last, there's lack of consent. So. For you to prove that, the, that your consent was not, uh, was not there, you have to follow those particular three attributes. Number one, the image. Uh, number two, the use for commercial purposes. And number three, you did not give, the, give them your consent to, for them to use that, those particular pictures. So uh, we're moving on to image rights. This case, actually, uh, the Catherine one that actually I've just mentioned was there even after, that came out after the act. It examined the definition of data, which actually says that uh, data is confirming. The, the case confirmed that your image is part of your data that is supposed to be protected. And also the case actually confirmed what constitutes an identifiable natural person according to the act. And the case also uh, gave who is a data subject according to section 26 and the duties and the responsibilities of a data processor under section 26, 29 of the act. Moving on, uh, lastly, uh, to, towards the, the end of my slides, we can see various data breaches in Kenya. Uh, this is the neighbors one, you all know about it. Uh, we also have the Kenya Revenue Authority suffered a data breach in 2020. The same in 2020, we had the Kenya National Transport and, Sa and Safety Authority, uh, personal details of 3 million drivers. 2019, we had the Kenya's largest mobile network operator Safaricom experienced a data breach which caused 11.5 one, one million customers. That's some of the instances where we have seen data breaches in Kenya. Now moving on to these cases of determination by the ODPC. We all know the ODPC uh, issued the notices. So these two cases, just telling you one, the number one one. So this case was a law firm Wamai and Alan advocates. So there was an employee in this particular firm who, who, did not, who, who actually got fired. I'm not sure he went, he was not fired. He, he got out of the, the, the firm 
he went to work for another different, a different firm, and then the employee shared the personal information he received during when he was working in the law firm. So, so the person in the law firm took the, the employer, the former employer to court, saying that he shared personal information. So the court said, uh, the court actually issued three, uh, no, no, not the court, the DPC. So the, 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 the partner filed a complaint to the DPC, with the DPC saying that the, the, former part, the partner, the former employee shared those particular details to, to, the, to a different uh, law firm. So what happened is uh, the DPC said that number one, the act does not, does, does not work for organizations, it works for personal people. So you see, I've just informed you that the, the partner went to court for the firm. The DPC said the act only works for natural persons and not organizations. Uh, number two, the DPC said those documents are public documents which you can find in Kenya law reports, so it does not infringe in any right to them. And lastly, the DPC said uh, the act actually requires for you to register as a processor and a, as, as a processor and a controller. But then you must not have been registered for the act to act on you. So for example, I'm an organization and I'm not registered. The ODPC says that uh, the act actually applies to me either way, even if I'm not registered as a, as, a, as a controller, I'm a processor. So meaning the act can act on anyone, not a must for you to register. And a notable case is ODPC said for one to be registered, for you to be mandatory to register as a data controller, I'm a processor, you have to have a turnout of 5 million uh, per year. So if you have below 5 million, it's not a must for you to register as a controller or a processor. So uh, that's uh, onto the last slide. You can see the notices now, which are very controversial. I know I haven't answered your question of images. So the person who was right for the image issue was her, because uh, answering to the equation, she took my photo, my photo as I was standing here using a different person's phone. The person who took the photo has the right of the image. I believe our panelists are expertise enough to explain on this particular issue. I do not want to infringe onto their rights. <laughs> to actually issue us with the details and also talk about the notices, which you have seen on the platform. You can see Quiver told you if you go to their, to their bar restaurant, you consent. Also Evo, Platinum. So that's the discussion for today. And I invite Susan to invite the panelists to come and share light on the issue of image rights and also talk about the notices. That was my time, and thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dixon, for um, that engaging question um, on who owns uh, the image, and also for um, that thorough presentation on consent. Um, and just highlighting uh, the rights of individuals with regard to the Data Protection Act uh, 2019, and also for canvassing the digital rights, I mean, digital subjects, um, sorry, apologies, data subjects compliance uh, with regard to uh, data processes and data controllers, and just showing us the status of that. Um, and I think that really brings us to uh, a great point in terms of looking at the notices that have recently uh, been given. And I'd like to invite the panelists to come on stage. Uh, and I would also like to invite the um, audience to please come sit to the uh, seats on the front row. Um, We'd appreciate that, uh, and uh, yeah, I, I think the panelists, if you can just please come to the come to the front. Then I'll give you this mic for the two of you, or the three of you. 
Okay, great. Uh, thank you. For those who are moving to the front, thank you so much. The requests are always so hard. So, you know, sometimes it's a no, sometimes it's a yes, sometimes it's a maybe. So thank you for those who are um, obliging uh, my request. And uh, I think before I set the tone, I'd love for um, our panelists to maybe introduce themselves. And we do have one panelist who is joining us online. Uh, Victor and Dede. So um, I think as that is being set up, I'd love for um, the panelists to introduce themselves and then I can set the tone for the conversation. Good evening, everyone. My name is Masi Wafula. Um, I am a data professional, stroke um, specialist. I have been in the data space for quite a while now, uh, even prior to the act being enacted. Um, I have um, prior experience in a multinational company uh, and also in the financial and banking space. And I'm happy to be here and happy to engage in the discourse. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, good, good evening. Uh, my name is Meshak Masibu. Funny enough, I'm a lawyer, but I've never been to the lawyers. I was even asking for directions, yeah, but um, I wear many hats, but the one I'm here under is I specialize on data protection and privacy. It's my everything, perhaps, if that's not overstating it, yeah. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Philip Kisaka. You've had that there are specialists on this panel. I don't call myself a specialist, so when the hard questions come, please direct them towards the right panelist. I am a privacy professional. I'm also an advocate of the High Court. Um, I practice in a number of areas in technology, media, and telecommunication. But for today's discussion, I am uh, going to be wearing the hat of a privacy professional. Thank you. I really like how you just disclaimed your way out of the questions. <laughs> So that's, that's, that's really funny. Um, so uh, I think we've seen, oh, great. Victor, how are you? Good evening. Good evening. Uh, can somebody can hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Um, Victor, maybe you can do an a introduction and then we can get into the conversation. Okay, sure. Um, yeah, so my name is Victor Ndebe. I also work in this uh, space and primarily as uh, on digital rights at Amnesty International in Kenya. And yeah, great to be on the space uh, side with uh, Philip, side that uh, uh, the experts are probably everywhere in that room. So we hope it's a conversation, not, uh, not a Q&A. Yeah, thank you for, for saying that. Um, so I'm just going to say a few things about the notices that uh, Dixon had uh, shown on the screen and then um, get into a few questions. So in an increasing digitalization um, of services and the widespread use of social media platforms, um, it's, brought numerous, it's brought light to numerous cases of data privacy violations in Kenya and the world at large. These violations have led to significant fines and penalties imposed on various organizations, raising critical questions about the rights and responsibilities of data controllers, data processors, and data subjects. So most primarily the, the notices that were on screen were the um, penalty notices issued by the ODPC on the 26th of September 2023, totaling um, Kenya shillings 9,375,000 and they were across different industries such as the entertainment industry via um, the Casa Vera lounge that was fined 1.85 million, um, education via Roma school that was fined 4.55 million uh, for posting images of a minor without parental consent, um, digital lending, um, uh, and this was uh, Mula, Limited, Mula Pride Limited, uh, that was fined 2.9, um, 2,975,000 for misusing personal information obtained from third parties to send threatening messages and phone calls to complainants. 
These notices have garnered significant attention in Kenya, sparking a debate around data protection, consent, and privacy rights. Moreover, they have served as a wake-up call for businesses, educational institutions, and other establishments that in their premises, might um, there might be engagements in photography, filming, and recording activities to take data protection seriously and adhere to the principles outlined in the Data Protection Act. So, I think it's really interesting, and, and at the beginning I mentioned this uh, post on Twitter where an establishment on their social media has posted an image and they've used smiley faces to cover the um, faces of their patrons. And uh, Dixon mentioned and highlighted that, uh, of course, the face is a protected attribute. So as an initial, um, your initial remarks, what is your first reaction to the recent news hitting the airwaves on the ODBC notices? I think it would be sexist to pass it again to, the, to, to do the ladies first thing again, yeah. Okay, so I think in terms of initial reactions, I think that's, that's a very, since someone sees a reaction, I also feel like putting an emoji there, because it feels like a more accurate reaction. But I think in terms of people responding, in terms of the decision itself, I think it's welcome, it's a good development, it's a lot of, it's progress, particularly for a country and our context so i think it's progress that's my initial reaction it's progress when you think about the, the the reaction again from people i think also it just speaks to a huge disconnect between the progress that's coming from the dpc and the people's understanding of what 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 happened so i think it, it, it it's progress but it demonstrates a, a huge lack of awareness in the, in terms of the public before and after that decision so it's it's it, it's one of those two things. So it both makes us feel, okay, well, I think that the is doing a good job, but then it calls for us to do a bit more in terms of making people understand what exactly is consent, what is informed consent, how can you, basic, the, the different aspects of consent. So I won't want to go so talk so much on that. I can give it also, give the reaction and then we'll go um, ahead. I think it was a matter of when, not a matter of if. Um, there's a lot of um, uh, lack of protection of personal data and so it was um, inevitable that it was going to happen. So for me, my reaction was, well, we saw it coming. Um, as Dixon said, it's a welcome move, but that just means that we have a bit more work to do in terms of educating and creating awareness on data protection and privacy. It becomes even tougher to speak after the professional, I mean the specialist, but um, I will try. Uh, my, my reaction is that then it creates room for improvement, one. And number two, it just shows the gap between the campaigns the office has been doing in terms of awareness, because I think they've, they've done quite a lot. Um, if you were to ask them in terms of reaching out to people in different parts of the of the country with respect to data protection, but then it exposes them in another area because then you hear the conversations out there uh, as regards the notices and people are like, wait, what law is this? What, what's going on? What I didn't know this existed and all that. So um, you even find for them going to the extent of redrafting the notices, while in fact the mistake is not in the notice, it just shows that there is a lack of awareness in the people who are supposed to enforce their rights as data subjects. And there's also a disconnect in the people who are supposed to facilitate enforcement of these rights. That is the controllers and sub, uh, controllers and processes. So I'm gonna stay on you, Philip. Um, given the uh, recent- um, is, is Victor still with us? Yes, I, I, I would hope he is. I want my I... fellow professional non-specialist to also comment <laughs> on this, if he's yes. still with us. Maybe as they're, as they're checking in on that, um, I'd like to uh, give you the follow-up question. So given the recent uh, fines by the ODPC, how can businesses ensure compliance with data protection laws? The, the first thing is for them to appreciate that this is a law that is with us, that is here to stay that is a trend that has been adopted globally. I mean, this the, the, the way we adopted the data protection law is through what we call the, the Brussels effect, where the EU is enforcing and acting a law, and then the world is trying to uh, mirror the law informally, then eventually they have to now codify laws to um, actually mirror what the EU is doing simply because of the trading advantage of the EU. Um, so it, it, it just goes down to show that businesses, first of all, need to seek for experts. This is the only time I mention experts. 
is that they need to seek for experts to advise them on these issues because we realized uh, many people are calling in or many people are trying to find the minimum level of compliance you know that gray area that 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 lowest mark that they can you know pass in order for them to be compliant which is very risky because the way a hospital would be compliant is not the same way a bank would be compliant is not the same way a school would be compliant so you need you need people in the space to be able to advise you and tell you you're a school probability of you processing minors or a minor's data is high so you need to uh, focus on one two three or you're a hospital you're processing probably a lot of sensitive personal data you need to comply this way um, businesses, number one, as I've said, need to hire experts on the same. Number two, they need to implement privacy by design because all these problems emanate from a position of we are trying to Im implement privacy as an add-on at the end of a product life cycle or at the end of um, implementing a certain campaign. It can't work out that way. So they need, they really need to implement privacy by design um, in order to um, uh, ensure compliance. And a lot of many things, let me not finish for that. I hope you see how I'm sneaking in these questions to you because you already gave a disclaimer, so I'm always going to come back to you. Uh, Victor, I, I have not forgotten you, and I have a very nice question for you. Um, if you can uh, do me the privilege of giving maybe your initial uh, reaction to the um, penalty, penalty notices that were given by the ODPC and um, answer this question or you know give your perspective on this question. What are the key legal and ethical considerations when using individuals' data without their consent as seen in the Casavera lounge case? And then we'll come back to Mercy and Meshik. Okay. Um, thanks very much, uh, Suzanne, uh, for, uh, for the questions and uh, yeah, I don't feel forgotten. Um, just online, also following uh, the experts speak. But um, my initial reactions were that the penalty notices were quite uh, uh, quite a good thing, especially coming hot in the heels of uh, of the world coin debacle or saga, if you call it. And of course, people questioning what then is the role of the ODPC, and then soon after to see the ODPC sort of tuck the whip. Uh, on some uh, some organizations that had uh, been uh, uh, that had run afoul of the law, and so I think it was a welcome move. Uh, it it signified uh, that the the regulator is uh, is 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 there and is is following uh, complaints that have been filed, um, and the resultant conversation, as uh, my colleagues have noted, of course, exposed the soft underbelly of what we call. Uh, the state of awareness on data protection in Kenya. And so um, uh, it still speaks to a lot of the work we need to do around awareness creation and um, and basically not just on the right, on the side of the data subject, but also awareness on, on the side of the data processes. And I think that's what uh, Philip was alluding to uh, in his in his earlier comment. When we come to um, when we come to the issues around um, the club and, and I mean the Casavera uh, notice, um, I think the main issue here I'd like to bring up and, and leave the rest to, to the panel is really the issue around consent um, as the key ethical and legal issue we have to ask ourselves here. Um, we know how much uh, consent, uh, how much our, our Data Protection Act is, is heavy on consent and at least at the very minimum, the expectation would be that we ensure that uh, any establishment engaging in, 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 in processing of personal data, which would include the images of, of the people who attend these businesses, would be at least get express um, unequivocal and free uh, consent and also specific consent to use that photo for that, uh, for that purpose. Um, it, it also behooves uh, these organizations or this, these entities to also ensure that consent or consent is provided by, of course, a statement or a clear from affirmative action uh, that signifies that someone has agreed uh, to the processing of their personal data uh, in a certain manner. Because if you put out, I mean, a notice of the notices that have been shared, then you ask yourself, at what point will you be able to prove that there was a clear affirmative action uh, 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 giving consent. And I think uh, when you look at uh, free consent, it has to be really under no pressure and undue influence uh, if someone is to give you a valid free consent. And so you ask yourself, if someone plasts a notice 
on the wall of a, of a, of a nightclub or any facility for that matter and says, you enter, you consent. I mean, there's no chance you'd be able to prove that there's free consent that was obtained without and due influence and pressure. In any case, a club's business is to, is to, is to sell uh, alcohol or to sell happiness for those who get happiness there. And so it, I have no expectation of going to a club that I'm going for a photo shoot. So it really has to be very clear that, um, that uh, people are able to give affirmative uh, uh, act, clear affirmative action to signify agreement to the consent. Uh, the last thing before I sit the floor is we have to ensure that when consent is, uh, is, 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 is provided or when you're seeking consent as an entity, uh, you need to state it in very clear, simple and plain language. And, and I think here the main question for us is whether that nature of consent that is, is, is requested by clubs, even if they if, if they do request for consent, comes up comes in this manner, and so we have to really really question consent as the main uh, uh, issue here. And of course, it's perhaps the legal basis uh, that they may have wanted to rely on to process uh, such data. Um, I can't stop at that uh, for now. Okay, thank you, Victor. And also for our online audience, uh, we'd like to hear from you as well. Um, I think uh, the audience potentially is from different backgrounds. So in light of the Data Protection Act that was enacted in 2019 in Kenya, what's your experience in terms of data protection and the awareness? Are you, you know, are you familiar with what it entails? Do you, you know, for example, know your rights as a, as a data subject, as an individual? Please let us know in the comment section. Um, we'd love to hear from you. So I'm going to move to Mercy and Meshak. Um, given what Victor has said on consent, um, what steps should organizations take to obtain proper consent for data usage, especially in public events uh, on social media? So um, maybe before I answer that, just to add on to what Victor has said, um, as much as you're obtaining consent, remember the, the onus lies on the person obtaining the consent to prove that they obtained consent from the owner of that, um, of that data. So that's important to note, and it also has to be recorded. And the record has to be retrievable at any one point. So if there is withdrawal of consent, that has to be recorded. If there is consent that's been provided, it has to be recorded. So in the spirit and in the principle of accountability, yeah, in data protection, there has to be a record of all the consents that have been received and consents that have been withdrawn. And withdrawal should be as simple or as easy as how the consent was provided. That's important to note. Now, on to your question uh, on how businesses can you know, implement proper consent management. Um, so first of all, it's important to understand your business processes. Let's start from there. What are your business processes? What data are you collecting in your business processes? In collecting that data, what purpose are you collecting that data for? That then gives you the lawful basis. So you're able to filter out what data or what processing is relying on content and what is not relying on content. Now on to what is relying on content. It's important to understand the various avenues or the various channels you're collecting that data. Yeah, because that is what will determine how you will implement the content clause. It could be a manual form or a physical form. So it could be that the content is on a physical form. It could be a digital um, collection of that data. So you will need to automate that content. And um, just as a side note, I, I always encourage to automate this um, data collection because it then makes it easier to implement certain controls. Sorry, so when you say automate, you mean using certain tools? Absolutely, okay. using tools, um, you can digitize. The problem is manual consent is very hard to put as a record and also to retrieve. Yeah, it also increases the work because you'll need to go back and capture it in a database probably. So that's what I talked about when I said automated. Yeah. So once you have obtained the content, again, not reiterating, I will not um, repeat what Victor said, but it has to be clear what that content is for. So if it is for direct marketing, it should be for direct marketing purposes only. If it is, it has to be for a specific purpose. 
Yeah. So once you've captured the consent, what's next? You need to be able to record that consent. Again, easier if it is automated or digitized. Um, if it is manual, it has to enter a certain um, structure. Yeah, so that you can you're able to retrieve it for audit trails. Um, if the individual wants to withdraw, again, this is one of the rights that the law provides to data subjects in terms of withdrawing their consent. Have you put in place mechanisms to ensure that if the data subject says, I no longer want my photo on social media, I no longer want my photo on your channels, are you able to remove that photo? Are you able, first of all, to capture that request? Are you able to remove that photo within the required timelines? And for consent, with withdraw consent, it's as soon as the, con the, the request to withdraw has been provided. You need to be able to um, action that request. So those are some of the things I think businesses need to do when uh, you're looking to implement a consent management. Okay, things are very interesting insights from everyone, I think, and a wealth of insights from everyone. I think I wouldn't have a lot to add. Maybe the disclaimer is, for me, I'm a salesman by by, by default. So even when it, I'm less modest, so you see, see my less modest, not as modest as the rest of the panel, my less modest take will be quite similar to what she mentioned. But I think another thing that we also might need to add on that is the whole concept of now if you, you cannot condition consent, for example, if you are offering a facility, and I think something based on what she mentioned, if you're offering a facility, it's, uh, it's you're giving access to a public a company, uh, something that people, the public needs access to, or is you're offering a service, you cannot condition consent consent, you cannot condition entry with consent. When you condition it, it stops being consent. Cons consent has to be volitional. It has to be something that you're giving voluntarily and you can withdraw it without any negative thing happening to you. So for example, you see situations where if you're being denied access to a, a particular place because you haven't consented to your data being being, being collected, then it, it's not really consent. So consent should be volitional, should be voluntary, should not, you withdrawing it or not granting that consent should not be a means by which you denied access or you shouldn't suffer any negative consequence to that. I also saw something today, I think around, with someone I tweeted around this, how Facebook is going to introduce a model where you either pay or you consent, yeah, exactly. So you see there, there are a lot of issues around, around that because essentially we all need to use Facebook. If you, if they, they tell you either consent or, or, or not use our platform and you really need it for maybe your business and all that, is that truly consent? So it really begs a lot of questions around just a lot what, what consent is. And I think also in terms of compliance, I'd want to add this something I had uh, Dixon really erudately mention. I just want to add a bit a, a bit on that that you mentioned something about getting compliant and getting registered and all that and the fact that even if you're a business that has a turnover below five million shillings, if you are in particular areas, let's say you're in financial services, you're in betting, you're in health services, you handle genetic data and all that, you need to register. So the uh, registration is also a component of compliance, not the whole of it, but it's a component. Now beyond that in terms of cons consent management, I think she's adequately covered that. Another crucial aspect that is important for businesses is training. You need to train the staff. For example, if you are a digital lending company that sometimes you work with a lot of these violations that you see someone has violated your, your someone's right to right to personal right to privacy and all that they usually occur at a very lower hierarchy in the, in, the, in the organization. It's rarely the CEO or the or the legal department. It's the person who's who's trying to to, to recover the one thousand shilling I'm sure loan that goes into all of these violations and all that. So another key thing is training. In, invoke people who are either a specialist by, by design or specialist by sales to be able to to be able to come and train and train your staff on what is data protection, what is privacy, how does it apply to your everyday business operations and now you're able to seal some of those loopholes that are that that lead to violations of the right to privacy. Yeah. Thank you for that, Meshek. And Philip, I'm coming to you. Um, what's your perspective on compliance by schools? So you'll see a lot of the time um, they use images of their best performing students or the talented students. So maybe you can share your perspective on that. Yeah, so probably I'll just add a bit to the conversation here before I move to uh, schools. I think we're very caught up in uh, discussing content as the only legal basis for processing data. For the longest time we've seen in clubs that one of the things they write at the entrance is that management reserves right of admission. So we need to be very careful not to assume that anytime we are denied admission or a service based on our refusal of consent, then we have already, our right to privacy has been infringed on. Why I'm saying that is that um, 
because of the, 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 the awareness that is out there. So data subjects are tending to, um, like recently I sit in the board of a digital credit provider and you see borrowers come in and they're like, you need to give me a loan, but I don't want to consent, you know? So it becomes, I mean, there are other legal bases, legitimate interest, there's a contractual necessity, legal obligation, vital interest and all that. So probably subjects also need to understand that there are other uh, things that allow you to process or a controller pro processor to process personal data in the absence of consent. Consent will only be extremely necessary, one, if you're processing data for commercial purposes. And I think that's what we uh, have, are seeing with the club photography, because they're doing that so that they attract more customers. Number two, if you're processing sensitive personal data, you need express consent. Number three, if you'll be uh, uh, doing a cross-border transfer of data, you'll need express consent. So there are, there are certain situations that consent is extremely necessary. But there are certain situations that um, contractual obligation or um, public interest would override the necessity for you to have consent. Now, that having been said, we move to schools. So when you talk about educational institutions and schools, the first thing that comes to mind is minors. Minors, which means they are under the age of 18, which means they cannot offer valid consent on their own. So this consent has to be granted by either guardian or a parent, which makes the whole process of granting consent very complex. One, because ordinarily you would not find parents going to school with children. Of course, it's just not possible. Number two, in the instance of boarding schools, then the whole journey of getting consent becomes a long one, which means it becomes more expensive on the controller or the processor in that instance. The other day I also had a question from a school where they were asking, since we've entrusted teachers with our children, can we also entrust consent on them? Uh, can, can we say because they already consent to so many things that they're doing or they already supervise so many things that they're doing, can we reasonably assume that we've delegated this to them? However, the act does not say that one would want to construe a guardian to mean a, a teacher in the context of school. Again, that's, I think, the, really pushing it, if you, if you were to ask me. The guardian needs to be the legal guardian. The parent needs to be the uh, guardian, which also extends to uh, people with special needs, people who cannot validly consent. And now this brought a discussion on if I'm going to um, a club, I have probably what many, I don't know this, I promise you, People call pre-gaming. I don't know what it is. I've just had it on the it's, streets. It's okay. It's okay. No yeah, judgment. No it's judgment. Not me, you know. Yeah. I know. Yeah. So people have already done what is called yeah, pre-gaming. And, and, and it brings the element of can you really consent if you're under the influence? You know, do you have capacity to, to, to consent? Um, I just thought to bring that out uh, even as we transition into the education uh, um, element of granting consent by children. Right, and, and thank you for highlighting that. I think, it, I think there's a definitely a distinction between consent and compliance. So, you know, even when you look at social media platforms, in the beginning we had Facebook, you know, uh, maybe Instagram, Twitter, and, you know, like if maybe someone you like is on that platform and, you know, you're trying to talk to them or you're trying to see them, you know, chances are you'll just, like, do it so that you can, like, maybe have that access. But there, it's not really that you are freely um, consenting to, you know, like, um, be on that platform. So, you know, thank you for highlighting that, um, that point. And I want to um, follow up with a question on um, digital lenders. So... I'd like to engage on that issue in terms of data processing for digital lenders. What is your immediate take on the actions of Moolah Pride? Um, so based on the actions, one, we, want, we, we also first of all need to understand the process before you get to a penalty notice. So the first thing, the, probably there was a report. We've not been given the whole background by the ODPC, but probably someone complained to the ODPC uh, through their website then they did an inv investigation, then they issued an enforcement notice. Now, when they issue an, an enforcement notice, they give you, I think, up to 21. They can only give you a minimum of 21 days to respond to the enforcement notice. And the enforcement notice would tell you what you need to do to correct the vice that is already happening. Then if you fail to correct or you fail to comply with the enforcement notice, then they move to issue a penalty notice. And uh, if you look at the act, there are a number of um, uh, uh, things they consider. They consider who reported the, the, the complaint. They consider your, your turnover. They consider previous 
um, violations to that office and, and what have you. So they, hold, they have a whole load of criteria that they use to consider the amount of money they will be charging you in terms of penalties. And so I want to probably assume, again, I'm using assumptions because this is not public knowledge yet. I want to assume that, that the lender in this scenario ignored the enforcement notice or during registration, they gave a dummy or a fake um, email address um, as the official email. And again, this goes to people who are registering as controllers and processors. You really need to be careful on the details you provide as your contact details, because ODPC will send you an enforcement notice on that email that you provided during registration. And I've seen many people subcontract, and the subcontractor will create an email address for that registration. Once registration is done and the certificate is given, that's it. You forget about the, that email. So you're not monitoring it. They've issued an enforcement notice. The next thing you're on the papers, you're like, wait. Then you're, you're up in arms with your advocates, but they're saying, these are the records we have. Is this you? Is this you? Yeah. So I think for them, it is a case of, again, my assumption of just ignoring the enforcement notice or simply not monitoring the proper communication channels they have given to the ODPC. Because all my communication with ODPC, none has ever come through the uh, PO box or they've never called me, all have always come through my emails, even on behalf of clients, I've always come through emails. So they need to be very careful with emails. Right. Um, and also, like, just to put it simply, um, there's a series of actions that is instituted or triggered once a situation like this occurs. And the data controller or data processor has chances and opportunities to uh, address them. And, you know, of course, as you highlighted, it might be that they're not checking their email or, you know, there's a bit of a, uh, a discrepancy on their end. Uh, but it is you, you are able to kind of um, mitigate so as you not not getting to a fine. Um, great. Victor, are you with us? Yes, yes I am following. Great. Great. Um, so we're having so much fun here, and we'd like to hear your thoughts on um, this question. So what is the role, what role does the ODPC play in enforcing data protection laws? And what should businesses know about their responsibilities in this regard? Uh, great. Uh, thanks for that, Susan. And uh, yeah, I guess there's a lot of fun on the other side. Um, including uh, some denials of certain food by Philip. But anyway, um, <laughs> the, ODPC, the ODPC has uh, has as multiple roles when you come to enforcement of the Data Protection Act. I mean, uh, this conversation and uh, even the previous conversation that preceded this and uh, this penalty notices has brought out the, the regulator face of ODPC. Um, basically as the enforcer of the law. But uh, the side that is also missing is also uh, the role of ODPC in awareness uh, creation as, as, as part of its enforcement of the act. Um, it's, not a, it's actually an obligation that the, the, that the law places on the ODPC uh, to conduct uh, public awareness. Uh, there's an obligation on the ODPC to promote uh, self-regulation within sectors. Uh, it is also their role to essentially um, promote even ADR, you know. So it has it has not for us, but the role I would like to speak to as I come to businesses is the awareness bit. Um, I work in, in 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 human rights and in the NGO sector, um, and our focus is primarily the data subject. And our view is that if the data subject is aware of their rights, then they're able to to get that agency to claim their rights. And in this particular sense, their rights, uh, their data subject rights. But what has significantly been missing in terms of how the awareness has been curated, both from our side in civil society and, and, and also ODPC uh, in, the, in the awareness program they've been doing is awareness, awareness creation amongst data controllers and data processors. Um, I'm of course aware that they had uh, at some point a uh, public awareness campaign across all the 47 counties. Um, but as you'd imagine, um, public awareness is a very uh, resource heavy uh, venture, both human and, and, and financial. And so 
we would not anticipate that in a one day session in county x uh, they would get the public or the community to that level of uh, awareness on, on on data protection and even the uh, and even the businesses so when we come to when we come to businesses and in and in in, in them knowing the the role they have to uh, your question was on in terms of businesses knowing their responsibilities in regards to uh, the data protection act um businesses i'm sure are properly advised as most of them would probably have uh, legal counsels and and everyone around them but the thing that i think businesses miss is the point that compliance with the uh, data protection law is 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 should not and should not be viewed as a box ticking exercise um i think it was philip or i don't know massive who was talking about the minimalistic approach that um, most businesses wish to take when it comes to uh, to data protection compliance um what they what they often miss is that data is a trust economy um if people don't trust you they'll not they'll not give you uh, data willfully and we can talk about all the case studies of everyone who has had a massive uh, data breach and, and and the resultant uh effect i mean even our government has seen what it means to to lack public trust in your data processing activities in terms of activities that have actually stalled in their digital identity projects so we have to get businesses to understand that data is is existing at trust economy i trust you i give you my data i don't trust you i'll restrict processing of my personal data and so businesses have to know that in so far as the data protection act is concerned registration is just but the first step um in compliance there are multiple things that they need to do and compliance as of course is not an event is a journey and because business priorities change business activities and ventures change and with that the data protection obligations the data processing activities will continuously change and so they have to situate in themselves and in their company cultures and corporate cultures that will have to walk the data protection journey uh for quite a while um and 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 it has no end in sight you so what we want is businesses to uh, just the same way you have a, an accounting a team you need the data protection team to ensure that you comply with with this law i mean not all businesses are at the scale where they can employ uh, a, a, a data protection officer i mean they could outsource all this uh services or share the services but the most important thing is for them to situate uh, data protection within their company culture because where we are headed as a country is that um so we have had all these huge aspirations of digital transformation in this country and so as we continue to digitize and lead the continent in digitization this will always be an issue that will come up and businesses have to know that it is their responsibility uh, to ensure that they keep us all safe as 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 their data subjects the last thing to mention uh, on this particular issue with businesses if you look at the number of registrations uh with the odpc um and uh the people who work with them daily i think philip massio and, and even mesha perhaps would have better figures but the numbers are significantly low as compared to the number of of, of businesses and companies we have and it and it essentially speaks to uh the apathy uh for for data protection and so those are the things that I would suggest we uh we look at thanks thank you victor and i'd like to stay on you um i appreciate you uh giving us a very thorough response and also this kind of statement on data being a trust economy um i think that greatly illustrates um the concept um I don't know how many times you mentioned awareness, but it was enough for me to want to ask you this next question. Um, how can public awareness and education initiatives help improve data protection practices in Kenya? Thanks, uh, thanks Susan. Yeah, awareness is uh, my bread and butter. So I have to ensure it is uh, thoroughly done. Um, awareness is very important for two reasons um actually may, one major reason that if people or if we get uh, our 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 country and and our citizenry to that level of awareness where people understand what data is um they understand the value of their personal data then we can start seeing steps towards uh, a data protection conscious uh country 
as it is we have a very uh we have a we have a huge challenge in knowledge we have a huge challenge in attitude uh, towards data i mean often as my work involves meeting communities in in both in the urban and the far flung areas you get a sense that people do not really understand the value of their data they'll tell you it's just a name it's just a number it's just a uh, a digit you know uh nini serikali haijui you know like what does the government know and and such and and you see that is a very dangerous attitude to have for us guys here who are trying to push for data protection but the people we work for uh do not care and so it is very important that awareness impacts knowledge so that people are able to know but not just know but also changes their attitudes towards uh data protection which will ultimately translate into a change in even the skills that people possess in terms of data protection someone will know that they have to read the terms and conditions that have this is how i disable uh, unnecessary cookies this is how I, i i i check permissions that apps have on my phone that is what uh, that's what we need to move um uh the country forward because if you look at the recent uh findings i mean if people really understood the value of their data and the concerns around data the queues uh for worldcoin despite the very interesting financial incentive would have been shorter if people really understood uh, the value of their data um we would see multi a multitude of 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 complaints across uh, uh the country flooding the odpc on various data uh data abusing practices that are carried out across the country because i mean focus has been on mobile lenders and a few other guys but we are yet to see that level where we we feel that people have an appreciation of data breaches from any uh, any sector that uh, that they submit their data to um when you look at also the the response in terms of what the response has been i mean i, I was in i was in turkana county just a week or two weeks after worldcoin had been stopped and similar conversations on awareness on data protection and what the community said is uh, we, we are just unlucky that they didn't get here otherwise would have signed up and and this is despite all the apro we had uh, online and and on on mainstream media and people are like i mean if they still showed up would queue for 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 the for the 7000 shillings and so it tells you that in a, so far as even they may be a little knowledge on what the challenges were with wallpoint the attitude and and the skills are still very lacking to summarize and to conclude the main interest we have or the main objective we have in in public awareness and education initiatives in Kenya on data protection uh in Kenya is to move this country to a privacy culture we need a culture of 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 privacy and you see if if it's ingrained as a culture it's 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 content and and manifest itself in what people do in business operations what people do even in non-profit uh, operations because it's a culture that people know i need to protect people's privacy this is a country where uh, i call person x they'll give me someone's number without flinching and even re- make a point to remind me don't tell them that it's me who was given you you know and that just shows how much we have a problem with uh, with awareness on the value of privacy so um so let me stop at that and uh, feed back to the to the panel Yeah, thank you so much Victor. Um I think we're all um victims of that situation where someone shared your number and then you know they they discreetly kind of tried to escape uh, from responsibility when they found out. So um thank you once again for uh, your response and your perspective on that question. Um I had asked the online audience to let us know in the comments um what their experience with the Data Protection Act is and we're just coming up to the Q&A section. we just have a few more questions to go so if you have any questions for the panelists please make sure to add them to the uh, comment section and i believe at some point we will read your uh, comments um so please feel free to add those there i am now back to philip mercy and meshek um i have a question for the three of you we have seen disclaimers circulating online from popular establishments Do you think the notices meet the requirements for consent under the Data Protection Act um and you know potentially kind of integrate any intellectual property aspects on that Um so we I think we've discussed consent in depth and we've talked about it being clear 
uh, it being uh, unambiguous, it being unequivocal, uh, you know, all these things. And um, also just throwing in a span into the works, talking about capacity to even consent when you're in that uh, state and capacity. So uh, informed consent has to be expressly given. And I think all these notices, what they're trying to do is to, to, to play around with the language to make it maybe more clearer, you know, make it more unambiguous and all that. But all this failed one test of making it expressly given. Because then how do you prove that this concept was expressly given? You look at um, how uh, uh, companies, uh, event companies or clubs um, in, the, in, the, in Europe have done this, is that they probably have wristbands, um, photography wristbands. They also have um, zoning or designated photography areas where they say that if you sit this side, then you are you're already consenting to photography and they've put those notices in a way that you are making an informed choice to sit in that um, specific area or section. Yeah, they also have, um, when, when you enhance data portability, so the best way clubs can, and this is not legal advice, it is just free advice. The best way they can do this thing is that they need to encourage what we call micro-influencing. Micro-influencing simply means that take a photo or let me take a photo of you, let me send it to you. If you post it, I give you a 10% discount on your bill. That, that, that enhances and it makes this personal data now fail to meet the threshold of commercial, uh, data being used for commercial purposes. It now moves into the general exemptions of data being used for a household purpose. That, that is very, I mean, I think I should have billed for that, so. But um, yeah, and there's so many other ways in, uh, you, can, you can navigate that issue of consent. So the notices will meet a lot of this threshold of being clear, it's clear and all that, but they'll, they'll always fail to meet that threshold of being expressly given. As Marcy mentioned, how do you document that this consent was given? How do you even retrieve it? How do you retrieve the, the, the affirmative action to this consent? Again, privacy by design plays a critical role here because you cannot have a consent form that has the accept button ticked by default. The default setting cannot be the affirmative action. You need to have someone knowing and reading through it and then making that affirmative action. You look at what we call um, click wrap and browse wrap contracts, how they're structured, that you have to either sc scroll through or you have to click through in order to get into the next um, level of um, whatever you're trying to do. And the click wrap already documents that you know you are consenting to move to the next step. If you do not click on this, then it won't take you to like either check out or do something of that sort. So I think the biggest problem with everything they're doing right now is they will they will definitely fail to meet that threshold of expressly uh, express consent being given. Another thing could be photographer identification that this is the official club photographer, uh, designated photography boots. You know that you have that when someone takes a photo from there, they're already consenting that this is something I'm doing and I know that this is being posted. And you're able to show that we actually went out of our way to inform these people that, uh, look, we are taking your photo one, and number two, we are posting your photo for commercial purpose. Because another thing I think they're feeling at is that they're giving a notice that we are taking your photograph. That is fine, that is good. But secondly, they're not giving or they're not seeking now your consent for them to use it for a commercial purpose, which has to be expressly given. And also this photography differs from um, CCTV footage because then for CCTV footage, they'll rely on a totally different legal basis, which they do not need to seek consent from you, but they just need to notify you that they are actually doing this for security purposes um, within the establishment. You've also asked on um, intellectual property and um, the, the issue with intellectual property is that there are also other things that come up when you talk about intellectual property, we talk about ownership. Um, I think we've had a proper demonstration of who owns and who is the owner of that photo. Is it commissioned, is it not commissioned? Um, in terms of ownership, you're also talking about licensing because most of these clubs will post a photo and then they'll post their logo somewhere in within the photo. So if, if, if someone else reposts it for another commercial purpose, um, are, we, are we bringing out issues of IP? And in fact, can the club say that they have ownership of this uh, ownership of this IP right, which is copyright, of course. Then we also talk about rights management. We move to, are they licensing people to use, you know, these photographs for whatever reason? 
Uh, there's also the use of these photos for fair use, so fair use of copyright material. Fair use could be something like journalistic purposes. So you're, uh, when, when, when you're having COVID and um, people used to flaunt the rules and you know, indulge past hours, when the police or when the media come and take photos and post those on newspapers, are you, are you gonna complain and say, look, copyright, IP, you know, data privacy and all that, there are exemptions in both uh, copyright, I mean, copyright law and data protection law. Data protection law will tell you journalistic purposes, you can uh, do whatever. Copyright, again, will tell you the same uh, on that. So I think my take on IP is on that. Here I am, you know, trying to keep in mind that you said you're not the expert, so you're not going to answer all these questions. And, you know, I mean, ah, yes, mercy. Uh, let's keep it to maybe one minute each, because uh, I see we're running um, a bit behind on time. Yeah, the professional answer. Yeah, see questions. him later for... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think I'll repeat uh, anything that Philippa said. I think um, he's, talk, he's touched to the, the basics of content. Uh, I think mine is in, the re in relation to minors' consents and maybe uh, just to touch on the issue of schools um, and issue of awareness, creating uh, awareness. While it is the school's duty to protect uh, uh, the, the children's data. It's also the parents and guardians' responsibility to understand the privacy risks involved uh, with having their children's data being posted on social media or on certain platforms. So I think it's important to also, as we're creating awareness, also create awareness uh, with, the, with parents, create awareness with guardians. Um, children nowadays are being exposed to technology at a very a young age and to be honest that is also creating uh, a lot of issues in terms of their digital footprint you know uh, you're putting the videos on tiktok you're putting the videos uh, i mean tiktok the other day was fined um, for privacy of minors issues so creating awareness and consent also goes to as a parent and as a legal guardian do you understand what rights uh, your child has in terms of their data and even as you're consenting or posting their photos all over the place do you understand the risks that you are exposing your child to and are you able to protect that child from those uh, privacy risks so yeah that's what i would say and for those who might not be familiar uh, would you kindly elaborate what a digital footprint is um, I'm not a techie, <laughs> disclaimer, so I'm not a techie, but in what I understand is the way you walk when or you're walking on the beach and you leave, you leave, you know, your footprint on the sand, it's very similar to what a uh, digital footprint is. It is evidence or proof that you have been um, in a certain, on a certain platform or online platform, um, and it, it doesn't get erased contrary right. to what people believe so yeah. you can imagine if you post a photo right now and 10 years 20 years we still have photos even after you have passed on we will still see the photos so that's your digital footprint there's also metadata that is stored yeah at the back end um, that actually can identify you as an individual and can be tweaked and it can be um, it can be amended or used uh, in a way that will uh, create risks for you. So it's not just what you see um, on, on, on the platform itself, there's also the metadata that can actually be accessed and, and, and used um, in, in a dangerous way. Right, um, thank you for that, Mercy. And I think, Meshak, I'm going to do you this favor of uh, having you answer or respond to a different question. Um, so what elements should notices include to align with the Data Protection Act for uh, um, recording consent? I mean, given, given what uh, Philip and Mercy have said, um, maybe you can follow up by responding to that question. Okay, so actually, it's, it's a very good favor you've given me. Do I wanted to take advantage of, of that to, to do a sales 
was when I was coming, they were supposed to get instructions for one of the, I think one of the, the schools to appeal that, but I haven't got any instructions yet. So I had an answer before. You see, when someone gives instructions, there is a, you'll talk this way and then if they don't. But so if I was talking before now instructions, I'd say it's actually really good to get, or this just to mention briefly or to someone, to, and there are many different people actually have expertise to get if you're a school, get someone to audit your practices and all that. Not even in a complex sense, just someone to look through what you're doing. It helps them pick some of these blind spots that you might actually miss and also now from beyond now that context of that I, okay now if i'm get to get instructions marketing myself oh, yeah yeah i'm going to forward the link yeah also i'd want to just bring in there's another there's a need for more clarity also from the data commissioners especially on issues like for example how you quantify the amounts for example if you if you're if you're finding a pass a person four million how did you quantify there's a lot of secrecy in terms of how you bring that formula that formula out and also this was a lot in terms of if you are yes of course you, you the money eventually goes to government what about actually compensating the person who was infringed there's not that provision about the actual the actual person so that's my post my potential fee after instructions respond but on that on the, on that point of the notice i think ideally if you it, it needs to be very specific i think what they've mentioned if you're getting specific if you're getting consent from or you're trying to get consent to get someone to take pictures in in, in your in your facility and all that so it needs to be very specific and it needs to be individualized. It can't be a general notice to everyone. So I think also, Philip mentioned something very interesting, the fact that also beyond the specificity, you need to also weigh the capacity. For example, you enter into a club, and I'm not saying I do that, but you enter into a club and, you, and, you, and you're saying at that point, and you consent and you sign, okay, I've signed, you can take my pictures. And then you- These disclaimers. Yeah, and then you get to a point and you're, you're drunk and then you, your mind is, is not there. So at that point is the consent vitiated. So that's also something maybe to discuss and maybe on the side of the clubs, maybe maybe they see someone is in that state, they need to go and maybe get that anything they take after that state, they need to get fresh consent the morning after. Yeah. Right. Um, and thank you for highlighting that as well. Fresh consent. Um, there are instances where you will be obligated as the data controller or data processor or the person collecting um, personal data to get a fresh uh, consent from the individual. So thank you for highlighting that. Victor, I'm coming to you. How can businesses balance informing customers and respecting data privacy rights under the law? Um, I think here for me, the, the main question is, or the main answer here is usually, the person at the center of this entire transaction will always be uh, the human subject. And so, to be honest, that is where I'd, I'd, I'd place the centrality. What I'm trying to, uh, uh, sorry, I was just trying to move something on the screen. So businesses have to have to know that the customer is central. They own their data. And I think uh, there's been recent conversations around the countries that have gone with the root of, of data principles and people actually being the principles of their own uh, information. And you see uh, in the commodification of data, then it's it essentially makes you as the data subject and uh, become the owner of that data. And so the business has to remember that um, you always have to be informed. And to be honest, uh, Susan, I don't know if we are really looking for a balance um, because a balance would perhaps put us in a place where we are saying, how do we weigh uh, business interests versus uh, uh, data subject rights? And it could be the case then we start thinking about, could there be a case where business interests would definitely supersede the data subject rights? And that would, of course, create, uh, uh, create problems. But I think the main thing that businesses can do when informing customers, I think it goes to the clarity of, of communication around consent. I believe that um, we, we would go back to the standards where, Things should be in clear, simple, uh, and plain language in communicating most of these uh, things, especially when you're spelling out the rights that someone has, uh, the recourse that someone has uh, as relates to their data, when you're spelling out consent, it has to be in a very clear, uh, simple, and plain language. I mean, for the club notices, uh, it has already been discussed here that their, their, their information is quite... Uh, it's quite 
drafted or worded wrongly because i mean how do you even uh, how do you even consent where do you say no where do you say yes but if you look at other previous examples let me even use uh walco and do it's a matter of course in court but if you look at like their privacy notices and their consent forms uh one of it is like 3400 words the other one is 3800 words if you look at the people who are lining up at kcc i don't know what time they had for them they didn't know when the 7k is, is reading confirmed received you know so you have to ensure that someone is able to go through what you want to do in the clear simple language to them and that's why i don't know who mentioned it on the panel but someone said it cannot be a generalized consent because um you may get someone who does not have the comprehension of 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 english or even swahili as i recently saw some privacy notices in swahili uh, that would understand what is really happening uh, what am I, what, what 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 is going on here so we have to ensure that businesses um uh properly inform customers and respect the rights under the law the law is not there to to curtail business interest i think it is there to facilitate uh, their interest in a win win scenario where they respect the rights and business keeps flowing um yeah i'll stop at that uh thank you for that victor i think it's it's coming out quite clearly that the notice is not enough um the establishment or the data controller or data processor has to empower the data subject by allowing them to either opt out or opt in um of these um practices or activities at their establishment um and uh, i just have one final question um before uh, everyone gives their parting shot um are there best practices for businesses when drafting uh, data collection or recording notices and also what are the consequences if you can add on what are the consequences of businesses who fail to comply yes meshak you can start because last time okay. they said everything before you oh yeah we actually so actually displace them out of content in a sense yeah so i think simplicity simplicity is really key so the the the, the idea is just something simple something easy to understand something that you can use you can document and say you actually got consent so it's not about how long it is it's not about how many how, how much jargon you use is it simple is it understandable both to the person giving the consent and to another inquiry relative is the odpc investigating is it also clear to them and is it clear to you as a person and you know what you're doing so i just want to say that simplicity yeah um i think you also have to understand the audience you have to understand the data subject and what you're trying to achieve and so tailoring uh the notice or the consent to the to the to the to the subject matter we've seen instances where um somebody went and copy pasted a privacy notice from another entity and didn't even change the name uh it was literally the same uh, company's name on that privacy notice but it was a different company so um tailoring that to the actual um uh, to the data subject and also to the content but also in terms of consent it is also to understand that um uh, again all the things we have mentioned over and above all the things we have mentioned what is the most convenient way for this to be provided to you remember um a data subject is a human being they have emotions so when they are coming to read the consent they are coming to read the privacy notice they are already forming an opinion and the more cumbersome it is the more complex it is the harder it is for you to get that consent yeah so we are not trying to coerce them into getting the consent we are trying to make the process smooth for them so that they are able to give the informed consent in a faster and in a smoother and in a more convenient way so we also have to leverage on technologies what technologies do you have in place that you can use to actually implement these notices implement this content and there are a lot now there's a lot of emerging technologies uh, that you can use for this um i think also the issue on notices with clubs again i, I want to repeat this is that the issue is in my opinion is not on the notice the notices are very well worded i think whoever is drafting these notices really took their english class very seriously or took chat gpt training lessons on youtube very seriously that is not the issue the issue is that consent goes beyond the notice so you've agreed that yes we are taking photographs then then what you know so another day two three days the club is doing a promotion for nyamachoma and now they're doing posters and your photo is there 
was their consent for that? They are doing a social media marketing, they're doing a campaign online, and they're using your was their consent for that? So the notices have the purpose for which they have been designed to, to inform you that when you get in here, we're taking photographs. That's not an issue. Now, what you do with that photograph pass, that is the issue. When he was talking about um, you need to seek fresh content the morning after, you know, um, it, 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 it looks laughable, but then it's necessary because then you agreed to your photo being taken. So your photo is in a database somewhere. Then how do you, we will now want to use your photo, then can you agree for us to use this uh, photo? Of course, when the power is back with the people, then it also encourages um, commercialization from the data subject uh, point of view. So you have things like influencer marketing. Influencers are paid for the same things ordinary revelers are not paid for. Why don't you also want to do it with you know, the general public? So I feel like, um, in my opinion, the notices are very well worded, that they're good, but we need to move past that and understand that the notice on the door is not content. And I think what people are using is that because CCTV footage, when, when a building or an organization is using CCTV footage for security, they'll put the notice and it suffices. But again, we know that they are using a different legal basis. Content is just one of the legal bases. So as long as they're not commercializing that CCTV footage, then they can get away without having uh, content. So in terms of best practices, I feel like I, I already men mentioned them. Uh, in uh, Just try maneuver that whole thing of having to post your photos, the photos uh, yourself, and try get it coming out from um, the people themselves, then you escape the liability of being under the Data Protection Act. Um, if you're using it for, again, journalistic purposes, which is very hard to justify in the situation of a club. Um, and which brings me to a question, maybe the specialist can assist me on this one, that is a blog, a, is a photo or is personal data put on a blog, does it fit within the category of a journalistic purpose, which makes it now um, uh, a legal basis for processing this personal data. I think we'll we'll, mar we'll let that question marinate, uh, Victor. Um, let me know if if I should repeat the question, but uh, yeah. But uh, Philip wanted to sleep on us the uh, question, <laughs> and maybe maybe just maybe we can add a, a last. One, a last question before I answer, and it's a question that has really been on my mind, and I saw it on, online recently around the photography at, at funerals where if you don't consent, and as you exit, you find a photo of yourself on a very huge paper, and uh, you know you know what happens when you don't buy, or the fears that we have when you don't buy. But anyway, in terms of, I think the best practices, as, as, as colleagues have noted, is that. Um, the clear, plain, simple wording of uh, of uh, data collection. Well, I don't know if it's really notices, uh, but whatever they use, I mean, if they communicate what they do with the with the data through privacy policies, I think this should be should be in clear ways and 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 should be very transparent in what exactly they are doing uh, with this information. I think on the notices, uh, Philip has said as much, but I would, what I would add there is that even then when drafting of these notices or when they're, when they're drafting and, 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 and placing this, uh, these notices, of course, I mean, the, the assumption is always that everyone is able to understand. I, I've not seen any of those notices, uh, in, in, in any other language as, as opposed to English, um, or I've not seen, uh, uh, they nowadays call them the hosts and the hostesses at the club sit, standing next to uh, those posters to explain to you what this that means uh, or, or dance around the, 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 the poster with those flashing things. You know, like nobody's there to explain to you this is what uh, you're getting into. So we have, we, we, we have to ensure that people endeavor and businesses endeavor uh, to ensure that insofar as drafting is done, it's done well, but also getting it to the people and people understanding what is this notice about is where it's, it is where the work is at and also the transparency in just saying this is how this thing is going to be done um your last question was also around the consequences i believe and i think the consequences have have been seen uh, uh globally and we are starting to see them locally where businesses are facing um uh significant amounts of fines i mean 
uh, the 4.55 mic uh, <laughs> the school I looked at the school profile it was quite uh, worrisome whether uh, that money will essentially close down that school and then now uh, us as, as amnesty will now be on the right to education angle are we using fines to violate people's right to education but anyway um, uh, those are things we, we we need to look at the consequences in fact if you look at the report of, of the of the ad hoc committee uh, that was looking into the processing activities of Wildcoin, one of the proposals they have made uh to to amend the data protection act to enhance the penalties in there so um with that see the light of day then of course the consequences will definitely be be dire uh to, to businesses and just businesses because also in this non-profit humanitarian sector uh, there are a lot of things that happen uh, that, uh, that that need redress and so it's a wholesome effort for any data processor uh, operating uh, within Kenya or processing data about Kenyans to know that um, the famous quote that Serikali uh, Konam Konoref and so soon uh, the law will catch up with them. Thank you. Thank you for that, Victor. Um, so I think I'm going to open the floor to our audience here at the Lawyers Hub and also to our online audience. Please put your questions in the comments. Um, so I'll give maybe two questions. So if there's, ah, yes, our two questions uh, have already been. Hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for this discussion. Uh, it's a very timely one. Uh, my name is Charlie. I'm from Wildlife Direct. So it deals with, we have a program with children where we offer safe spaces for children to come and learn about conservation. And under the film department that involves, you know, filming and documentation, and we have informed consent by, we have consent rather by, from their parents. So my question goes to everyone <laughs> in the panel. Uh, so this is in terms of just creating consent on who will publish the photos and videos. Does stating generally implementing, like the stating implementing, implementing partners or donors will, pu will publish this in internal reporting and exporting reporting, like in internal reporting and also external reporting suffice? That's the question. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Sherry Oyer. I'm an advocate of the High Court of Kenya, and uh, I deal with data protection and privacy issues. So um, my question is linked to, I think I'll direct it to Victor because he's spoken about it, the issue of apathy among data controllers and processors. So um, I've dealt with controllers who really do not care. So as long as they have registered and as long as they have a privacy policy that Probably they have um, downloaded somewhere on the internet and edited Kidogo. At least they don't use the same name of the company that they um, copy pasted from. They deem it as um, as good enough. And also, um, my issue also is with regards to tying that and and the fact that data subjects really do not know their rights. And I'm just thinking, is the ODPC adequately? Um, equipped or do they have capacity to really go into because what I've usually had most of the times is um, will they really what will what what will really happen to us you know so that also um, because they just think the ODPC is in Nairobi if I am somewhere in Kerogoya or Kisumu or somewhere in Kisi no one really is bothering with me so I'm just wondering does the ODPC have enough capacity and also just another comment on on Wildcoin I think um, our social economic posture, we cannot, um, we cannot um, put the onus on, on data subjects as we saw, as we saw in Wildcoin, issues of Wildcoin first broke that the ODPC then said, um, be on the lookout, these people are out there. I don't think with our social economic posture, we can um, place the onus on the data subject. I think um, the ODPC and or the ODPC, which has that mandate, really has that um, mandate to ensure that the the people who are coming into the country to because Wildcoin, of course, is not a Kenyan entity, that they're actually complying so that it's not just you have registered and you have a privacy policy. As you've seen, um, just because there's consent, they, they had 3,000, almost 3,000 words. No one is really reading into that. So 
that and and the fact that some we don't understand some people don't understand we cannot read it obviously and then of course the economic issue we can't um divert that mandate to the data subject thank you maybe uh, to add on that uh, Meshak, just one question now in this case in the us uh there was this uh famous girl uh lady who was photographed and then uh, she took that photo and posted it on her Instagram. Then she was sued uh, for posting her photo. Then uh, the court fined her a lot of money. So yesterday, uh, after the cabinet disheveled, uh, the people who cried very much. Uh, today in the morning posted the picture of our vice president in their socials. So to Marcy and Philip, Based on those two stories, can we sue the, the person who cried for posting the VP poster based on the US story? Thank you. I think just to add on to what Dixon has said, um, uh, the example here is, let's say, pictures taken by a paparazzi during an event, let's say, in Hollywood. And then they upload this photo on, on let's say, Getty Images let's say the photo was of Kim Kardashian, it was taken at uh, an event, an award ceremony, then it's uh, uploaded on uh, Getty Images, Kim Kardashian goes ahead and posts that photo on Instagram, she sued, I mean, this guy wins. Um, is that fair use, like when a photo of you is taken by a paparazzi, is that fair use? Okay, I don't know. Let me just go because I put too much confidence in my ability to remember. <laughs> I didn't carry a book. So kindly, if you're asking me just really short questions. So I'll go to the one that I remember. I think my colleagues will tackle the other ones. So the question about from Wildlife Direct and the general exclamation that the donors will be able to see. I think it depends, again, on how ideally you should get an individual consent form that everyone signs. If you're, if you're getting someone in to sell, if it's children, if it's children, you need to get the guardian to sign. But if they're, if they're coming for any purpose that, or rather for any function that will involve collecting their personal information, you need to get the individual consent, either digitally, as she mentioned, or in writing. That's general. I've seen it because in, in my other life, I also work with funders and this is what they need. But especially now with funders, it's even more complex because if they're outside the country, it means you'll be exporting this information outside the country. So even the consent needs to be more expressed, especially in that context, that you, information will be collected for this purpose and also will share with our funders in X and Y country. So it's also really important to, be, to get that specific and express consent. Just on the a slight comment on the one about the, the photos and 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 unfair use and all that. I think there are defenses, ideally, you can make some of those defenses, and I think what you mentioned about journalistic purposes and all that, so there are some defenses you can make in, in different contexts, so it's a very context-specific question, so it depends on the particular situation. For example, if you come and you paparazzi and you take up, you take up, for example, you, you become famous for some reason, you take a picture and you go and you publish it somewhere without my consent, it's, it's to an extent that that's violating my right to privacy, my, my data subject rights, because ideally it's my data, it's my image that you've taken and published somewhere, so so it's it, in that sense you violated my right and it's, it's wrong in that context but then you can always know try and raise the defenses and say okay you're using it a fair use and all that but bottom line according to my at least my, my opinion it's, it's a violation of my right to publish my picture without first getting my consent irrespective of why you you're publishing so the longer the longer questions i'll, I'll give the ones who thought ahead <laughs> yeah. i don't know if the professional wants to go first so in the, in the in the American context, um, how IP operates and how privacy operates in uh, the U.S. is totally different from how it operates in uh, the EU. They are just now trying to play, you know, catch up um, with with and trying to align their practices to to um, the EU. So probably what passed or what could pass um, as maybe the photo being posted on Getty Images and her posting and her being sued would not pass in the EU. Um, the way the way intellectual property rights are applied in the different in the two jurisdictions is quite different. So you find sometimes where one looks at the uh, specific case and figures that this will not pass in the EU, but it can pass in the US. They would force it somehow to uh, be violated in the US then now and force in the US and, and and all that. So there's a lot of IP issues in that. 
as compared uh, to to privacy. Um, the question from Wildlife Direct again, as he's mentioned, there's a lot of we, when we hear donor and partners, we know there's a lot of cross-border transfer of data, which opens you up to a whole load of things that you need to be for, uh, considering. Apart from express consent, you need to be uh, considering things like, is there uh, a provision, an adequacy provision clause to the country? I mean, an adequacy provision with the country that this data is being transferred to. In the absence of that, are there a standard contractual clauses? Um, um, in, in the contract between you and them, to show that they will maintain privacy to the levels that the country or Kenya has um, put in place or has uh, committed to comply with, with regard to the act. So yeah, this, and again, with the issue of consent, it just needs to be expressed. Another thing you need to consider is when these children attain the age of majority, then how do you, they proceed to enforce their rights, like the right to withdraw consent now? and they withdraw, do you have those mechanisms in place? If they withdraw and you're in the middle of producing a documentary, how does it affect a documentary? If, if the, the child is getting to 18 and they're all over, the, does it mean now that you do away with that footage and all that? So you need to be very, uh, again, this goes to privacy by design, and it also goes to market uh, what uh, Meshak does on a day-to-day -day as a service, what I also do on a day-to-day -day as a service. So, And Philip, just to, just to expand on, on something that you've mentioned quite a bit, you talk about privacy by design. Can you expand on that? Yeah, so the easiest way to describe privacy by design is um, when you're installing an app on an iPhone. Um, no shade to Android owners. I'm just speaking from a point of experience. <laughs> So when you're in installing, and I don't know if this happens on Android, please. When, when you're done installing, uh, for instance, if it's X or Instagram or what have you, at the end of it, it'll, uh, it'll ask you that, it'll give you a whole paragraph that this app tracks you, whatever, for the best experience or whatever. Then it asks you, allow app to track or allow app not to track. That is privacy by design, which means you're not able to continue using the app unless you have read that notice, which is a pop-up, and you cannot just wish it away. You have to make an affirmative action. And the allow app to track is very big and very conspicuous to allow you to you know, make that informed choice. When, when um, I, I, I don't have a presentation here, but when Facebook started off, they used to have very good privacy by design. They used to give you a notice and say, we will use your data for this, but with, with time, with the GDPR coming into place, now what they've done is that they've created affirmative action for you not to focus on your privacy very conspicuous so they'll put a facebook game and then they'll put play now very big and then the opposite of play now is now something that will uh, enable you not to consent to you no know, proceeding so of course you'll click on play now because it, it's welcoming that's that's not privacy by design however it's you know it's maintaining that gray area um, again, if I was to speak from a salesman's point of view, of course, that is what I'd be advising my client, like, yo, look, we've already put it there, so we are within the law, and I think Mesha could be doing the same. But from, from a data subject point of view, it's, it's not very good practice. Again, I'd like to mention that compliance with a privacy, I mean, compliance with, um, with a principle-related law or a principle-guided law is very hard. Because privacy by design, the, 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 the Data Protection Act will tell you that implement technical and organizational measures with regard to the budgets you have. So, so if, if you implement a technical safeguard that is not um, very robust and something happens and you're able to justify that, look, we had, this is, the, this is the budget that we had in relation to this. If a breach occurs, if something occurs, that, does that also still meet the threshold of you having complied with things like privacy by design, because privacy by design is all about implementing proper technical and organizational safeguards. I think to add on that, I think yes, to yes. add on that, <laughs> um, privacy by design, and um, as for you, um, I think also you could carry out a data protection impact assessment. And what that means is that you're able to identify the privacy risks involved with you processing that data, or your donors processing that data, what impact would that have on the owners of that data, which are, who are the children, yeah? So when you carry out a DPIA, what that means then is you're able to identify the risk. It's really a risk assessment on privacy. 
what are the risks involved in the processing activities? Um, if you're transferring across borders, uh, are you aware of how that environment looks like, where that data is going? The donors themselves, um, are they identified to the individuals to whom you know, whose data, whose data is being collected and processed. Um, and then once you identify the risks, you're also able to um, find out how you can mitigate those risks and maybe close the gap so that you can reduce the impact of the risks to those individuals. Um, experts here, Philip and, and Meshak, can definitely assist uh, with, such, um, with such issues. Um, also, there's a multifaceted approach in terms of uh, cross-border transfer of data. So um, Philip mentioned adequacy uh, decisions or adequacy of the laws in those countries, um, having standard contractual clauses or just a data processing agreement with uh, the donors because you're transferring the data to them. And then also having the consent, you know, because it's child data, it's transfer of sensitive personal data. So having a multi, um, a multi safe, multi safe, multiple safeguards would um, help more than just having one particular safeguard in terms of cross-border transfer of data. Um, I know you asked the question uh, for Victor in terms of apathy and attitude, but this is what I have to say in terms of, um, of, 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 of the uptake of data compliance, uh, data protection compliance. It is and he had said it before, compliance is a journey. It's not a destination. And it will go on and on and on. Europe is still trying to comply, yeah? Even with the EU coming up several years before us, they're still trying to comply. They're still trying to get to terms with what data protection is, what protection of their you know, privacy means. We've had our constitution for so long, and our right to privacy is enshrined in our constitution. And yet, um, it took the data protection law to come in to then say, we are now giving effect to Article 31 on our right to privacy, yeah? So it will still take a while. That, not, that is not to say that we should not continue creating awareness and creating um, awareness not just in Nairobi. I mean, the ODPC has now opened branches in other areas. It is just a matter of time, and this will come to pass. Um, at the end of the day, remember, and, and this is what I always encourage, think of your client's data your the children's data as your own personal data how would you want your data to be handled that is the same way you should handle the other person's um, data because it's privacy at the end of the day okay thank you so much for that mercy victor there's uh one final question for you on uh data apathy um among data controllers and data processors as well as the odpc's capacity to um kind of enforce and implement some of the, the data protection law overall yeah, I think um, so apathy, one of the things that we have to look at is, is the attitude, of course, of the controllers and the processors. Um, and as, as it has been with many laws that have come into place after many of these uh, corporations, organizations, and entities started, you know, there's usually apathy at the, at, the, at the start of this, but as soon as they understand that the law is in no way trying to uh, to limit the, the scope of their business or to limit imagination. You know, there's always been the tension that data protection laws are there to stifle innovation and, and, and creativity. They'll soon understand that this law is, is, is of benefit to them. Sadly, in the data protection case is that the understanding will come when, uh, of course, the law is, is on, the, on the wrong side of the law. Uh, if, if they don't comply. And you see, once a regulator is taking action on people is when people are now, because I'm sure in the last two months, uh, for those who their bread and butter rely, uh, re is dependent on better protection work, they would know that clients have reached out quite a lot. I mean, the phone calls have increased and uh, because people are worried on the enforcement action being taken. You hear now schools are calling lawyers, hey, what's What's happening? What did that school do that we should not do? Clubs are, 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 are running around issuing notices. So if that is going to change. It's going to take a time. But the only way to sort of uh, uh, hasten it or, or turbocharge it is, is getting a regulator that will push this process uh, quicker. And that comes to the second question on whether DPC is, is sufficiently uh, equipped. I would say, um, with the resources that we know are available to ODPC, 
um, both financial and human. I would actually say that it has been one of the the offices that has really done the most with with with, with much 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 less. Um, and it's a thing for us practitioners within the space, uh, activists within the space, and advocates within the space to always remember that advocating for a properly established data protection uh, commissioner or a data protection authority um, is to the benefit of us all, especially uh, for those who their bread and butter comes from this space. Because the more they're able to act, the more business uh, Philip uh, and Mesha could get. And, uh, <laughs> so we have, to, we have to ensure that that office is, 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 is is, is strong enough. And that means that when we hear that uh, Parliament is passing a budget of a paltry 600 million to, uh, to ODPC, it should concern us all, not just ODPC, but also the practitioners within the space, because it means that their capacity will remain limited. I even don't know which resources they want to use to investigate Walcott, because that 600k could just be, 600 million should be. Uh, they're dropping the ocean in, in running a full on investigation against. Us. Uh, a corporation like WorldCoin. And so it should concern us that uh, our, parliament, our parliament and our, our systems and structures are not facilitative enough for DPC to do the most. I mean, with a staff establishment of roughly, I think they're now 84 or something, uh, 80 staff. I mean, what's, what's the much you can do? And those 80 staff are spread across the admin roles and technical roles. So we have to advocate that ODPC expands its scope. I know um, they have recently opened an office in Mombasa, Kisumu and Nakuru. Um, and so it means, of course, they'll be getting out there, but there's still a lot more to be done. But the point where activists and advocates and practitioners in this space come in is where we, we also advocate for an increased capacity to DPC. We protect the independence of that office because, uh, of course, as you know now, uh, there's deep interest in controlling that office because some people somewhere may have realized uh, it's easy to make money, just find someone somewhere on, on some data uh, breach and or even check down people, you know, like some agencies like checking us down. So um, we have to ensure that the space remains um, remains safe and conducive for the regulator to operate. Um, and, and that means then that we do away with the apathy, we get to knowledge, we change our attitude, we change our skills and get Kenya to a privacy culture. Thank you. Thank you for that, Victor. Um, and maybe if I can get some assistance on maybe reading some of the YouTube comments, the comments on the um, that the online audience may have placed, that'd be great. Um, and we can potentially start with the parting shot. So Victor, um, before you are moved outside the screen, <laughs> maybe you can start us off with a parting shot and, and potentially add general comments to schools, um, digital credit facilities, and ent entertainment establishments. Um, you, you can kind of highlight what they, sh they can keep in mind and also give a parting shot. Sure, uh, and thanks for that, um, Susan. So I think the general comments to actually all the three entities you have mentioned, the schools, uh, digital credit lenders or providers and entertainment facilities, is just comply, comply, comply. I mean, it's not, it's not in bad faith that we, we want you to comply. It is for you to protect uh, and, and, and respect the rights to privacy of Kenyan citizens and, and, and anyone who interacts with your facilities. For schools, particularly, it's very important because uh, it involves our children, um, and it ha it could have lifelong impacts in terms of how their their data is used. I mean, we have all these conversations around TikTok just because our kids are on those platforms, and 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 the lifelong impact those platforms have in terms of the privacy breaches. Um, so my parting shot and general comment will be there that they need to comply. I mean. Uh, the resources are there for them to comply, not just financial, but human. Mm. We have an increased, uh, I mean, how many, uh, very many practitioners are now venturing into the space. So it means they should be able to find uh, proper and sound advice on how, to, on how to comply. It is in their best interest to do so, but ultimately it is rights respecting. And of course, without going into detail of business and human rights uh, obligations that they have, 
<clears throat> as a parting shot, uh, one of course is to just say uh, many thanks to lawyers up for organizing this conversation in, in light of these recent uh, uh, happenings within the data space, which are really nice. Um, and, and just to say that uh, these conversations should keep going so that these are actually part of the awareness activities we are talking about that people need to have. I mean, uh, one person gets to hear about this today, they talk about it at their workplace, they see a change and, and, and so forth and so on. So just to, just to thank you and say that we always have to remember that a human is at the center of this conversation. It's not uh, some someone in abstract or something in abstract. And so the rights of these people have to be respected. Thank you. Thank you for that, Victor. And before we get to the um, parting shot of our three panelists um, here at the Lawyers Hub, I'll just read one or two comments from our uh, online audience. Everyone smiles in the same language, says, as much as legal professionals are attending seminars and trainings on data protection, it looks like other stakeholders need these workshops as well. Legal professionals take leverage of this now. Uh, Nabutola Wanjala says, for now, most organizations are just firefighting. Um, so we appreciate your comments uh, for the online audience. And um, for your questions, I think we can highlight them um, maybe on email or on, or on other platforms. But please uh, be sure to continue engaging with us. Um, yes, uh, Philip, Mercy, and Meshak, kindly give your parting shots. Okay, so I think my parting shot will be, it's good to be self-aware, and I think when you attend some of these things, it's also good to, to learn. For example, I'm just here and I've realized I'm actually a violator of some of these laws that we're actually talking about, what sharing contacts, and I, okay, I won't confess, because now I'm on camera, but you the point confessed. is, it's also already good confessed. to, it's also You're really already good, <laughs> the point is, it's good to be self-aware, to realize that in as much as we speak to people, sometimes you're also speaking to ourselves and the organizations we represent in a different way. So it's just good to learn how can I also uh, practice data, data hygiene in a way and how can I change some of the small, small things that we do to violate people's rights because it goes a long way, the small things and all that. Then also now I wear many hats and one is in civil society and the other is business, is business so it's, it's quite difficult because ideally in one bit it's more humanity and the other bit it's more the pocket. But for humanity's sake, I think it's good to we can double down on the efforts to, to, to build public awareness and try and see all the ways that, that we can build public awareness. The workshops that they've mentioned, it's a good idea. Let's do more of that. If the guys who are funding, they can fund the guys doing awareness. You know, like Amnesty does, Kicktanet does also. Different organizations do awareness campaigns, so funding will go a long way. From a business sense, it's also really good to connect with professionals to meet those, those, those needs, because people take time to build the capacity to be able to help. And if you have the needs, reach out to the different professionals to meet your needs. Thank you. Thank you, Meshak. Mercy? Um, I think for me, it's just to say that um, data governance, data protection, anything data right now is quite disruptive and data protection is not different. Um, that means businesses need to invest yeah, and be intentional about ensuring data protection compliance, buy into those privacy frameworks, buy into those privacy programs, um, hire experts to do, whether they're internal or external, hire them to be able to implement a proper and a robust uh, privacy framework, because that's the only way you're going to ensure that you comply and you keep complying, because compliance is a journey, as Victor said. As an individual, I think it's also important for you to understand um, all this right, everything we're talking about, how does it affect you at an individual capacity? You and your household and the people who are around you, how does it affect you? Because it will change your mindset as you go to the supermarket, as you go, as you enter a building and um, you're asked for your ID, you'll start questioning those small, small things, yeah? When you open a website and you see a cookies policy, you'll start questioning those small things. And that's what we need. We need people and data subjects to understand what the law is all about, what rights they have, because it also helps to drive compliance um, from the business perspective or from entities perspective. It helps to drive that compliance and create accountability. Thank you. Philip, uh, what of those who do not have the budget to invest in these, uh, these uh, technical and organizational measures, or technical, because organizational, you can have policies and ETC, but yeah. So unlike Meshak, I offer credit facilities. 
can just come, we'll talk and discuss, and uh, I have you sorted. But anyway, that was on a light note. Um, I think this, this is a regulation that has come. It, 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 it is here with us, and um, organizations just need to create a budget for, for, for these things. And um, even as I do my parting shot, I, I think there's one thing we probably didn't address, where the ODPC has now given the, the penalties, and uh, what next for the aggrieved data subject? Um, the next thing is for you to pursue this through normal civil um, law courts uh, uh, channels so that you're able to, I mean, get compensation for damages. Um, much as the Act prescribes that 5 million or 1% of annual turnover, whichever is lower, if in the case of an undertaking, damages, you know, the, the, the amount of damages are, are not limited. It'll just depend on how you've argued out your case and uh, you know how you've brought out the injury to yourself or the injury to a class. Um, I also I am also the assistant secretary at the, at the Data Privacy and Governance Society of Kenya. We are a society that is uh, heavy on privacy and just bringing together privacy professionals in this space, um, creating awareness. We have CPDs running every month, so uh, for now. Uh, you can find us on LinkedIn at Data Governance uh, Pros Kenya, uh, the same as uh, for Twitter. Uh, also, you can email us at dataprivacyke at gmail.com. I'll hang around for a few minutes. So if you want to join the society and find out what we are all about, you can always join. These lobby groups and these societies, including Kicktonet, Amnesty, are there for um, these very specific things on awareness. I remember the question by, I think Sherry was also on, does the ODPC have capacity to first of all um, do awareness and then enforcement and all that? This is a collective responsibility. The market has to respond that such that it is not the ODPC that is the only one doing these things. And this is how we best respond by either forming these associations or being members or joining these associations for us to better respond to the changing dynamic in the data uh, protection space. So from me, thank you very much for hosting us, Lawyers Hub. We look forward to more sessions like this and more discussions like this. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you for that. And thank you to all the panelists. Thank you to our online audience and our um, audience um, here at the Lawyers Hub. It's been a, an engaging conversation. Um, and I noticed that we're all wearing blue. So this is a testament to lawyers only wearing three to four colors. And a reminder to wear a vibrant color tomorrow to celebrate the end of the week. Um, I think we can all agree that in the complex world of consent, one of the primary aspects is awareness and uh, for you know everyone to specifically the controllers and processors to take a simple approach to how they communicate this information and also do capacity building and train uh, and also engage with ODPC in this journey of compliance. Thank you so much to our online audience. Thank you to our audience here at Lawyers Hub. Um, we appreciate your attention and your participation and um, before we started the session, in the spirit of good practice, and because we're talking about consent, I had given the panelists uh, release forms. <laughs> Meshak, uh, yours is there. Uh, it's just that uh, I think uh, the timing, but yours is there. Um, and this is specifically to get their consent um, to take an image and then use that image on our uh, Lawyers Hub website. So I think to close up, we, we, we can take the picture. And uh, yes, I mean, it, it, the, the paper is there. I think if you have it there, just show so that please express consent. You, you confirm, C can, we, can we take the picture, everyone, yes? Okay, okay, thank you. Victor, we will also virtually send you yours. Um, but yes, I think we can take the picture now and wrap up the session. Yes, uh, welcome. And to note is that, like your organization, at the Lawyers Hub, we do offer trainings monthly. Uh, you can also reach us at our Lawyers Hub website and also on our Twitter handle at Lawyers Hub Kenya, also on LinkedIn. But most importantly, we, we do offer various services uh, like trainings for data protection, immigration services if you want to go to the country. Uh, we have our immigration experts there, uh, Jack. If you want to visit your friend in Canada, please reach out to, to us. We can be able to offer you guys very <laughs> good services. Please uh, feel welcome in Lawyers Up anytime. 
any place. Thank you for coming. There is tea there. Please don't go home angry. <laughs> yeah um yes so uh as dixon has said feel free to yeah have some tea engage um speak to the panelists if you'd like and uh, have a good evening